for this final session of the first day of the Widening the Pipeline closing training, we're going to hear from Emma Carew Broba. Emma is the Director of Careers and Culture for the Marshall Project, and she's also founder of Kimbop Media, a company that she'll tell us all about. But she's also co-founder of something called Sincerely Leaders of Color. And that leads us to why I uh, titled the session Leaders of Color Unite. Because I believe that uh, uniting our voices, uniting our, our efforts and energies would make a huge difference in the trajectory of so many careers in this business. So we're very eager to hear from you and we're very grateful that you've joined us, Emma. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much. I'm super glad to be here with you all. Um, I prepared a couple of slides, so if I can just go ahead and share my screen, I'll um, get started. So, uh, so hello, welcome. I'm super glad that you're all here. Uh, this is a little bit about me. I'm Emma Kuru-Groba. I'm the director of Curse Culture at the Marshall Project. I'm also the founder of Kimbot Media. I've had kind of a jack of all trades sort of career. I was a local journalist. I've worked in data, who in social media audience and digital strategy. I've been editor and newsroom leader. And we've also spent time on the tech side working in products, uh, building content management systems. So I do a lot of work around this question is what would it look like if there's a general generation of journalists of color who are ready to leave the industry? Um, we know that there are small steps being made, right? We're uh, in the most recent, which was a couple of years ago, uh, analysis of newspapers, for example. Most big major uh, newspapers are now led by someone who is not a white male, which is the first time that's happened um, since they've been keeping track of those numbers. Uh, but the American newsrooms are so much whiter than the communities they cover and substantially more male, especially in newsroom positions, uh, leadership positions. So, you know, last year CNN wrote this piece, newsroom leadership has never been this diverse, but it's not enough. Uh, and so, this is a quote from Danielle Felton, who at the time was editor-in-chief of HuffPost, uh, diversity doesn't stop with like Obama becomes the president, somehow everyone says racism over, and obviously that's not how things work. So the problem we're trying to solve here, uh, and as I, my product brain works a little bit, is we're always asking this question, is what is the problem we're trying to solve? Well, the problem that I'm trying to solve is the fact that it's not about putting one newsroom editor of color at the leadership level. It's about installing them and hiring them throughout the organization, in social media, uh, in different types of roles, and if you don't have folks of color, folks from different backgrounds all over the place in your uh, in your company, in your news organization, you really don't have a diverse newsroom. So let's talk about how we get there. Uh, I want to talk about what makes us inspired and how we're going to make a plan to move forward. Do you know what you want to do next? What is your next adventure going to bring? What do you hope your next job or role is? Hi, um, Emma. I'm Gabrielle Suttles. I'm a reporter for a reporter for Politifact. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do. <laughs> That's all. Thanks so much for sharing. <laughs> Pass the mic now. Is this working? Hi, Emma. It's Chris Rogers. You probably see me on the JSC Slack. Um, Hi, Chris. I actually want to go into, I just saw the last day, I want to go into investigative journalism, mm -hmm. just because I'm like, in Michigan, it's very overlooked when it comes to investigative journalism, and I'd love to like, focus on the whole Great Lakes state, and also possibly expand out to the entire Midwest region. Well, thanks for on this Thank side. You. Hi, Emma, can you hear me? It's nice to have a sham. How are you? Hey, hi, it's good to see you. It's good to see you too. Um, so I've not thought about it, and I, I've been doing like daily reporting for a while. I've been at newspapers, and I think I kind of want to transition out of that and like do podcasting just because it's a different medium. Um, I've done it before, I've been, I posted a podcast before, and I centered on developmental disability. Um, and I think I just need a different channel. So I need something to wake me up because I feel like I've fallen out of love with writing. 
Um, I took a creative writing course at the beginning of the year, so I'm like, maybe I need to do like more creative writing and then kind of transition my recording mind to a different medium. So I'm hoping to kind of do that, maybe on the latter part of the year. Hi, my name is Torrance Blazer. I'm with the Miami Herald. Um, I would say the next role that I envision for myself would be um, an amalgamation of audience growth slash B team, maybe business, real estate, or racial wealth gap. Very cool. I love how specific some of these visions are. It'll make what comes next much easier. Let's take one more. Sure. <clears throat> hi. Oh, hi. Hello. Hi. 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 My name's Nina. I'm with Mississippi Today. I thought that I was kind of in my dream role right now, but honestly, I could probably see a future of doing a little bit more project-based stuff and maybe stepping into an org like the Marshall Project, but that's more specific, you know, criminal justice reporter. Very cool. Excellent. Thank you so much for all of you who have shared. I appreciate you being put on the spot and sharing out. Um, <clears throat> so the most important thing you can do as you think about what you want to do next is how are you going to stay inspired? So who has the kind of job you currently have that you are currently interested in? Um, how did they get there? Who do they represent? And honestly, who is missing from the table of power? Most of the time, it's folks like us, right? Um, it's people of color, it's people from uh, marginalized sexualities or, or other uh, socioeconomic statuses. Um, and it's super important that we step into these roles, become these people who we're all excited to become next uh, because it helps move the industry forward. It helps move, um, you know, inclusion and equity across the, the across journalism forward. We can't just have journalists of color in entry level roles or mid career roles. We need to have journalists of color across the whole organization that we work in. We need to have journalists of color with deep benches of experience um, representing at the table. So this is another thing that I talk a lot about in my work is that not all managers are leaders and not all leaders are managers. Um, I hope that folks can really take those two concepts and hold them separately. Management is about, you know, uh, policies and, and making sure your employees have what they need uh, and, and that they're doing their work and that they're meeting their goals and progress and things like that. Leadership is much more about citizenry of the newsroom or the organization, about vision, about coaching and mentorship. Um, and so I hope that if nothing else you take away from this talk is that not all managers are great leaders and not all great leaders have to be managers. There's a lot of ways for you to step into a leadership role without necessarily becoming somebody who has to uh, approve timesheets and schedules and sick days and stuff like that, which is also very awesome work to be doing. And if you are doing it, that's like awesome. That's great work. And keep up the internet. So, what makes a good manager a great leader? Um, they are intentional and inclusive. Great leaders have an expectation of excellence. And they help their team get there. They have domain expertise. They're, they're uh, very, very good at something and bring a lot of value to the team as a leader. And they have a strong vision and clearly communicated goals, right? And this is the most important part is that uh, if you're boss or you are the boss uh, and there's not a strong vision of success, it's not clear how we're going to get to that vision of success, that's where things start to break down and you see ineffective leadership. How many of you can think of a great leader in news that you work, either that you work for currently or that you worked for in the past? How many of you have a clear idea of who this person is? Seeing some hands come up. That's great. Um, does anyone want to come on, uh, please pass the mic around and maybe take like two to three descriptions of that great leader? What makes this person a great leader in your eyes? So I'm Sarah Lajani, I'm from Insider. Um, I've had previous editors that I would say were good editors because they were very much encouraging on the ideas that I had and they had sort of a yes attitude and a attitude of, okay, 
here's this idea, here's how we can make it better, or here's how we can make it applicable to our audience, um, or put a news pack to it. Um, and they, were, they, they sort of gave me the space to do the reporting and to do the, the work that I needed to do, while also giving me sort of guidance on how do I make it better. Um, Awesome, I love that. Thank you for sharing. Hi, uh, my name is Amanda Goki. I am a reporter with the Boston Globe. Um, I worked with an editor previously. Um, he was an editor at NHPR and we worked together on this project about redistricting. He was just like, he came in, he had a vision. We had like a really great pre-reporting conversation. It was really generative. He was asking all of the right questions, but also making space for my ideas and the things that I thought were interesting about the project. Um, there was a ton of support in the process as well. We sort of laid out, I made a plan for what I was gonna do on the reporting trip for infield reporting, and he was just like very supportive of the plan and you know made clear that if I sort of like encountered any roadblocks just to call him. Um, and then I think like in the editing process as well, um, there was like really good developmental questions through the draft. So I think all of that was just like a very positive experience that I had with um, this editor as a leader. Excellent. Thank you for sharing. One more? If not, I will share one. Um, I met the Washington bureau chief for Knight Ritter in 1994 yeah, at the uh, Unity conference in Atlanta and I impressed him with my knowledge of Chilean wine on a Thursday night and on a Monday morning he uh, invited me to come and work in the Washington Bureau and Rich Oppel always assumed that I could do whatever I said I wanted to do it was never a question if I pitched a story idea he said have at it can't wait to read it and that to me is somebody who is supportive and who understands the value in sort of infusing you with confidence. So, yeah, throughout, I'm hearing um, when folks feel valued by a good leader is really important and feel supported. I think those are really strong traits. I would love to see those. Uh, as we continue building our toolkits. So, thanks, um, The next part is make a plan, right? So you're inspired, you know what you want to do next, um, how are we going to get there? I like to use route mapping, which comes from product management and technology, to build a plan out that's based around goals, has success metrics built in, and remembers that it's not about a mission accomplished moment where you say, we won, we did it, it's over. It's about the long and short term wins and the progress along the way. So tools are tools, right? This is a couple of examples of using uh, project management tools like Trello or Airtable. You can use a piece of paper, you can print out calendars. It doesn't really matter how you keep your ideas organized, but I would recommend that you choose a system that works for you and stick to it. So a good plan gets specific. We talk about what done looks like, uh, which again, completion may not be the goal. So done may be one measure of success, but it might not be the only measure of success. Deadline, priority level, scope. Scope is so important, and we'll talk more about this later, is how to estimate how long something is gonna take you. Um, and you can think about scope in a lot of ways. I like to use DOGS, I think like use t-shirt sizes. Uh, is it a small, medium, or large task? Are we talking about a chihuahua, a beetle, or a mastiff, right? What kind of situation are we about to get into? I like road mapping because it allows you to have parallel tracks, right? So you can say, these are my reporting goals, uh, and these are my research goals, or these are my writing goals, and these are my audience goals, right? Uh, and you can look at things at the same time. Um, breaking a big idea down for execution. So you've got your vision, you know what you want to accomplish next. Next, you set up goals. Goals can use the SMART goal uh, framework where it's uh, specific, measurable, accessible, uh, relevant, and, and uh, time bound. 
you can um, just have a looser version of that, which might be more like an OKR situation. Um, so objectives and key results. But either way, you want to have outcome-driven goals. So what is it you want to happen at the end? And how will you know you've been successful? Once you have your goals in place, you can build out projects. Projects are things that you collaborate on with other people, right? So they're multi-step. And finally, projects get broken down into tasks which are owned by a single person and is a tiny piece of work that can't be broken down any further, right? So we're trying to make, our goal is to uh, feed more people. Our project is to assembly line and make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And a task might be spread the peanut butter on the jelly. Uh, the next task might be put the second piece of bread on the sandwich. Another task might be cut the sandwich with triangles. Uh, hopefully that, that makes sense and it's cool. Uh, you can use milestones to work backwards. So if you know you're trying to, uh, you know, meet this goal in the end of the quarter, what needs to be done at the halfway point? What needs to be done one week from now, one month from the deadline? Uh, and you can kind of fill your calendar in that way and build your plan uh, from the back forward. To break an idea down into tasks, I try to think about what are the three things you need in order to achieve that idea, right? What's first, what's second, what's last? What is your opener, your middle, your closer? Uh, and try to break those tasks into even smaller pieces of work, like the sandwich uh, assembly line. Finally, you can use time boxing to guide your efforts. This is where the t-shirts and the dog come back into play. Uh, is it something that is like a 10-minute task? You can just bang it out right now. It's just like responding to an email or something like that. Is it something that's going to take you a day, a week, a couple hours a day for six weeks? Ultimately, what's the maximum amount of time you're going to spend on something, right? Uh, so one of the teams that I work with at the Marshall Project, they have a 30-minute rule, right? You can spin your wheels and investigate something for 30 minutes, but after that, you've got to ask for help. Right, and this is a great way to say, okay, uh, if I delegate something to somebody on my team, and I'll say, okay, spend more than 90 minutes on this, right? It's to avoid people going down long rabbit holes or investigations of a concept that may not turn out, right? So it's how long are you able to spin your wheels or investigate something before it's time to move on? And that's how time boxing works, which is really helpful. So. Uh, with the rest of the time, I would just like to open it up for questions. Folks are welcome to stay in touch. My email address is ecg at themarshallproject.org. I'm at in the Peru on Twitter, although I'm there less and less these days. Uh, and in a various number of slacks, like the Journal of Color Slack, News Nerdery, DEI Coalition, and I'm at in the Peru in all of those places as well. So happy to take questions for the rest of the time. Thank you, Emma. Um, and thanks so much. Hi, Emma. Hi, it's Gabrielle from PolitiFact again. Um, just to circle back to the first question that you asked us and what do you want to do for in five years? If so Diva doesn't think I was lying earlier. Um, I did think, you know, we had a conversation earlier about um, maybe being a teacher or something like that, which I would love to do, but if I'm completely honest, I don't know if I'll be a teacher in, ten, in five years, maybe down the line, but I, I'm open to opportunities. Is that... Is it okay to be so open-minded? Yeah, so I also did not know I wanted to teach. Um, and so got into like guest lecturing. So I picked a topic that I was good at and I would tell people, you know, I was really good at, uh, when I worked with data, uh, data journalist, I um, got really good at Google Fusion Table, which is like a very specific piece of technology for a moment in time that has long since passed us. Um, but I gave that same lecture to several people's classes at the time, right? So I think pick something that you're good at that you can explain to people and try teaching it to them. You could teach peer-to-peer -peer in your news organization. You could mentor students through NADJ or AAJA's student newsroom programs. You could, um, there's like a lot of ways to dip your toes into teaching to find out if you really like it without having to like sign up for a full semester of teaching, which can be very overwhelming and a big job. Um, but if you are looking to go that way, I think just start telling people. That's the most important thing you can do if there's something you want to do next, is just tell people that you want to do it. 
um, y'all don't sit there and waffle about whether you're qualified or good enough. Like, just go, just tell people. Tell people that you want to try it. That's okay. That's totally cool. One of the most constant conversations we've had recording in progress this past year <laughs> has been the topic of lived experience and how it is interpreted, how it is received in the newsroom setting. So I would love it if you would just give us some background insight into your journey as a journalist and uh, how lived experience has been uh, perceived by you or received. So it's happened a couple of ways for me. So the probably the, the worst thing that happened was in my very early career, I had an editor who was in college who told me I couldn't cover the Chinese New Year because it looked like a conflict of interest. Right, and so I'm not Chinese uh, for one, which oh my God. Separately, and it shouldn't have bad either way. Mm. But that was very frustrating for me to learn that I would be stereotyped in the newsroom because of how I look. Right, that uh, simply showing up in this candy bar wrapper that I had yeah. going would put other people at discom in a discomforted position. Right, just my being there in the room. Um, and so that was kind of a punch in the teeth as an 18, 19 year old kid, you know? No one really wants to be told um, this experience may not be as, as uh, enjoyable for you because of bias, because of discrimination, right? No one really wants to enjoy that uh, part of the job, but it's true and it happens. It's happened to me in many newsrooms, big newsrooms, small newsrooms, local newsrooms. Um, that's the most like specific example I can give you, but it, it comes out in a lot of ways, right? It's um, people asking you about immigration status, or if your parents are still married, or all kind. People think they can ask a lot of really weird, really inappropriate questions of people of color. And remember, you are not there to be their educator. You are not hired by your news organization to represent every person who's ever looked like you or ever had your similar life experience. And so while it is important to bring our authentic selves to the news organization, I myself have stopped coaching in the newsroom. I you get me exactly as I come. There's not going to be me for white people, me for leadership people, me for the people that I'm managing. It's just like, you just get me. And that is part of what, that came out of my consulting work, right? It really took a long time of building up my self-esteem and my confidence to say, if you don't want to work with me because I have radical things to say, that's okay, right? Especially in DEI work, especially as I was weighing clients and news organizations to work with, um, there are lots of people I won't work with because they're not, they don't have shared values, because they're still trying to you know, be convinced that diversity matters or inclusion is important. And I'm not here to be that friend for them. I'm here to push them uh, into, the, into the radical space of being less racist. And that is often very uncomfortable for people. I, also, I don't know if I answered the question. You did. Long arc. <laughs> no, you absolutely did. Um, another thing I'd like you to, to revisit was from our first conversation when you told me that so much of your career has been sort of serendipity. You have just, opportunities have come to you and you've taken them. It wasn't necessarily a, a straight line, but you've been open to receiving some really interesting opportunities. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. I mean, I, every job that I've held since I was 24 has been an unexpected journey for me, right? I, I came out of school, I wanted to be a reporter, I wanted to work at the newspaper, I wanted to work in local, and I had that job at 24. And I was okay at it. Um, I was not going to get fired for being the worst reporter in, a, in the world, but I very clearly wasn't going to win a Pulitzer by the time I turned 30, which of course was the goal at the time. Um, and so I started to think about, like, well, what else am I good at? How else can I add value as a journalist? It led me to social media, it led me to data. Um, and so, you know, am I good at chatting up a source in like a cafe? No, that's okay, right? Like what I'm good at is digging in data and talking to people uh, through social media accounts and, and, and audience engagement. 
So I think it's really about being open to your skill set and letting your skills shine and leaning into the things that you're the best at and the things that make you special, right? Um, there's a fine line there between being pigeonholed. Uh, no one wants to be, you know, I had a friend who uh, in the last election cycle, like, oh, you know, was somehow ended up as the block reporter covering Herman Cain, right? Somehow, just, just who knows how that happened, right? But of course we all know exactly how that happened. And she pushed back and said, like, I will do this job, but I can cover any candidate on this field. And that needs to be respected. And that was very important. Um, so, you know, when I came out of school, it was basically you could become a reporter or a copy editor. And those were your options if you were a word person. Um, and when I was at the search Tribune, I was told, you can go back to reporting or you can go to the copy desk. And I was like, oh, that doesn't sound right. I want to do other things. <laughs> I want to make maps for my stories. I want to, uh, you know, post on social media. I want to do video. I want to do all these things that we weren't set up to do at the time. And so, you know, my ambitions were very, have always been aggressive. And I've always kind of believed I'll never be as hungry and young and aggressive and ambitious as I am today as I was yesterday. Um, and if I'm not in a news organization that's going to take advantage of those things, then what am I doing? I'm just not a news organization that's just looking for a warm body and a desk. That's, that's not what I wanted my career to be built on. Any other questions? I guess another question, I was just looking over uh, some of the things you're doing. How do you uh, balance all of your different uh, hustles? Um, I'm fascinated by like the diversity of your skill set and how you've been able to monetize and utilize that. Can you just speak to that, the thought process behind how you develop that, I guess, the understanding of, I can be the director of culture at Smart Project, but I can also create my own company and consult. Um, and I can also be a co-founder. Like, can you just talk to that diverse? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, there's a couple things there, right? It's one that, I've always struggled with, felt like being I was penalized for accomplishing in six hours what somebody else might accomplish in nine hours, right? So nine hours of work for someone else might not be a full day of work for me. Um, and, and that I think is true for probably most people in this room, right? Is that you are used to being extraordinary, you are used to being hustlers, you know how to make economy of a minute, an economy of an hour. So the next thing to do is to say, okay, how do I monetize my skill set, right? What are the things that people are constantly asking me, right? People are constantly asking me for resume tips, so I made slides so I can just give them to people, right? I'm not gonna charge somebody to help with their resume. I'm just gonna give them my free tips. Um, somebody wants me to do recruitment, right? They're trying to fill a panel. They need three people of color. They don't know anybody. They're working journalism. Um, so I charge for that now. Right? I have a diverse network. I've worked very hard to build up a reverse Rolodex of people of color from all over this industry. If you would like me to open that little box of friends, it's going to cost you. And I'm going to take those friends out for pizza with that money, you know? Um, that's real. There's real value in who you are as an individual, the network you bring to the table, the problems you know how to solve. And how to talk about building a business around those skills is a whole other conversation we can have separately. But I do think, you know, Mitra Kalina, who I think maybe some of you guys know about, um, has this great column about putting together your career as a portfolio, right? One company doesn't own my time just because I have a job with them. Um, I'm constantly working, I'm constantly hustling. And it's because I've come up in an industry that's been volatile and, and ever-changing. And I've always wanted to have something that was my own so that if the rug gets pulled out from underneath me in one area or another, I'm not left totally just like in the middle of the street being like, what just happened to me? I have nothing, right? So I think understanding how to make money off of your skill set and what you like to do for money is a, are, are two very different sets of skills sometimes, uh, and I think it's worth interrogating both sides of that house, right? What can you do to make uh, a living, and what do you love to do that happens to all to make money? 
Let's talk a bit about being a woman of color and striving mm -hmm. to be a leader or to get that seat at the table or just simply to get your opinions heard and valued. Um, I can speak for the African-American woman. Um, sometimes that's uh, uh, perceived as being the angry black woman, pushy, uh, you know, who does she think she is? And I know that obviously from the Asian perspective, there are cultural stereotypes that come into play. And when people look at you, they have an expectation of how you're going to behave. Talk a little bit about how you have navigated that. For sure. I mean, it's not lost on me that almost every single person hired me to do diversity work could have, and in some possibility should have, hired someone who was Black to bring that lived experience to the table, right? Um, however, I, I often find myself kind of battling, you know, the, the model minority stereotype of Asian American space in a lot of the workplaces, but also that we're this um, kind of safe person of color. You know, they're, we're the closest to white people in some ways, right? Uh, which is just like a weird thing to live with and sit with, but it's so true. People think that they can say things to me that they might not say to somebody who is black or, or uh, more dark brown skin, you know, Latino or South Asian, Southeast Asian. Um, I don't know why. <laughs> People think it's okay. It's like it's, it's still inappropriate. Um, so there, so there's like the inappropriateness, right? The inappropriateness of just existing in a majority white institution and, and dealing with the fact that there are people who have um, limitations around what we're talking about here today, right? They can't picture it. They can't see it. They don't like it. They don't work on it. Whatever the range of reasoning may or may not be, the end result is you, as a leader of color, end up feeling kind of weird, or like you don't belong, or you've got imposter syndrome, right? Like this is something I struggle with all the time, right? Um, I can waffle and oscillate between being a big loser with no job, or a queen who is building her empire. Any day, either one of those people is me, and, and that back and forth, I lose so much time, I lose so much energy um, trying to convince myself that I'm not a loser with no job, that I have a job, <laughs> that I have you know things to offer and stuff, um, or that you know I do belong at this table. Um, I'm very, very guilty of child's tabling myself, right? I often don't think of myself as the grown-up in the room, even though I have this leadership role, even though I founded my own company, even though I've been brought in as an executive consultant, I still view myself as a baby in the newsroom, as like a child, because I was treated like that for so long. And I was hardwired to associate 65-year-old white men as the boxes, right? I was socialized to understand that my place was to listen and to execute and to not make mistakes, right? It can be very lonely. You're often the only person of color at that level. Um, or the only woman, or the only woman of color, if any is true. Imposter syndrome is, is very, is it something that they gave us to keep us, to hold us in our places, or is it something that we gave ourselves that inadvertently holds us back from accepting and, and grabbing the future that is rightfully ours? I don't know. But uh, what I try to do is tell that voice inside my head to just shut up and look at the evidence. Right, the evidence says, my business card says, I'm the director of careers and culture. Um, that means that I'm in charge of things. That means I have to make decisions. <laughs> that means I have to help people. Um, so I'm, I'm very much an evidence-based individual, right? The same way that I would report a story out if I was going to look at a story and, and ask that question. Oh, um, we have a question about work-life balance. How do you navigate that? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I moved to the beach during the pandemic. Okay. Right. So if you can live across the street from the beach, I would highly recommend it. <laughs> uh, you know, if that's not possible, I understand. I would say find a hobby. Find something that makes you really happy outside of journalism and outside of being a journalist. Um, 
I spent a lot of time in my early career wrapped up in the identity of being a journalist. And the first time I lost a journalism job, I felt like my whole soul had been ripped apart. I felt like I was nothing left as a human being. And it was devastating. Um, and I wanted very much to never be in those shoes again. And so to me, you know, when you look at, if you search, look at my portfolio or anything like that, um, you know, it says, or even on like my Instagram bio, it says I'm a journalist, but I'm also a lot of other things. Um, you know, it says I'm a journalist and storyteller. I'm a leader, a coach, and a trainer. But I'm also an artist, a baker, a knitter, and an auntie. And those things are equally as important to my identity as being a journalist, as being a woman of color in the newsroom, as being a leader in these spaces, um, and just remembering that you're a whole person and that it matters that you have joy in your life, sunshine on your face, people to love. Uh, the most important people in my early career were the ones who reminded me that finding someone to fall in love with and holding on to them tightly was more important than any scoop or story would ever be. And that really stuck with me. Um, I'm married to two other journalists, so take it for what it's worth. Take it for great of salt. But um, yeah, building a life that you feel connected to and you feel inspired by outside of work, I think is the most important thing. Whether it's a hobby, whether it's a side hustle, whether it's a pet, a plant, a kid, a person, um, a car, whatever it is that you love nourishing and building, um, that is very important. That you have something to fill your soul, that it isn't just work. I think Emma and Jamila are trying to tell us something to, yeah. about joy and really nourishing our, our spirit and our soul. Um, I want to ask you a personal question since people are being shy. And that is about the whole social media persona. Um, mm. I have struggled with that through the years. I absolutely have uh, resisted it, felt like it didn't feel authentic, and I'm about the work, and I don't want to have to chase followers, and this and that. Um, the only platform, really, that I've ever uh, engaged in was LinkedIn, but that was because I could tell stories. And while I was living in East Africa, I was able to tell the stories of what happened to me while I was there, and so I built a following there. But Instagram, Twitter, all the rest of them, I, I just, I blow hot and cold. I just, you know, sometimes I'll post and other times I don't prioritize it. Do I need therapy? Or <laughs> what, what would you say about the, the need to be consistent? Or is it really relevant? Do I really need to just knuckle down and, and commit? Yeah, I mean, I'm using Twitter less and less these days. It's it's just gotten really garbagey. I don't think there's as much validation and uh, value that there used to be. You know, people used to do good reporting on Twitter. I and mean, there's been a lot of bad reporting on Twitter, don't get me wrong. Um, but social media has 100% opened up local reporting in ways that we couldn't have imagined 20 years ago. Uh, it has opened up source development. It has allowed the proliferation of diverse voices. It, it has led to uh, salary transparency and equity in the hiring field, right? We, when we see places like Writers of Color doing sad trombone on places <laughs> that are putting out diversity reports but not being transparent about salary, that's really important. That, that was not a thing when I started in this industry. And so, I do think that participating in social media makes sense for a lot of journalists. I don't think that everyone needs to be on Twitter anymore. I really don't. And I really never believed that, right? Um, there were good conversations to be listening to at different pockets of the internet. There have been times where journalists have built their profile and their career out of being a social media persona, for better or for worse. Um, 
but it's really hard. I think it's hard because a lot of people work in news organizations that don't understand social media and how fast it changes. I think that a lot of social media policies have been written by the people who are not digital natives and who don't really value what can come out of social media. Um, you know, but again, as a woman of color on the internet, it is not fun. It is not an exciting place to be. It is not a pleasurable and enjoyable experience most of the time. So I can't in good conscience say journalists of color, women of color, you know, folks from historic marginalized backgrounds got to put themselves out there on social media in order to be successful as journalists. I don't believe that. I think that there are ways to do it. I think that if you have some certain kinds of jobs, they will require it. Uh, White House correspondent type roles, right? Like. So other people who work in audience and social media may have a big social media following, um, things like that. But every single person does not need to be engaging in that space today. It's not healthy, it's not safe. The, if the platforms are not going to engage in actual safety measures, I, I don't see a point in us being there or mandating that journalists be there. I, I hear you, and I guess the only thing that I um, challenge myself on is Again, the cultural upbringing, the religious stuff, is it egotistical? Are you boasting? I mean, you know, and I truly believe that's at the core of, of my hesitancy. As much as I've totally walked away from that persona, I really feel that for a lot of uh, people of color, but certainly women of color in particular, especially if they've had the religious stuff to deal with, um, that could be a barrier. It's just, I don't want to put myself out there. I don't want to seem like I'm bragging. And that could be a, a yeah. detriment. Yes, absolutely. I mean, they will find something. The internet writ, writ large will find a reason to care people of color, movement of color, part on the internet just for existing. Never mind potentially having a radical thought in your mind or taking a controversial position on something or you know i think religion is a great example right it's it it's a very fraught uh topic for a lot of people it can be a very damaging experience for people but it can also be something that sustains a lot of people and is very central to their identity and so when we have these conversations we want to be respectful and we ultimately want to look to see where we have similarities and overlaps. We just want you to talk about your company and when you created it and just tell us a little bit more about what it's focused on. For sure. So I lost my job in the beginning of 2019 and Kim Bach came out of the panic that happened thereafter. So I lost my job, I spent the day day drinking, I ran away for two weeks and spent uh, some time with my brother and his kids and then came back and was like, well, got to make money, right? Yeah. So I started by telling people that I was looking for work. Uh, I told people on LinkedIn, I put it on Twitter, I put it on uh, email lists that I was in, Slacks that I was in, and just started telling people, you know, I'm a digital strategist, I've got audience experience, I, I can build CMSs, I can translate between editorial and technology leadership teams, um, and I'm open to kind of odds and ends. And then, you know, I got a couple of gigs here and there and spent the first, you know, six months just kind of scraping by and saying like, okay, well, I can do this while I look for jobs and figure out what I want to do next. But ultimately, what led me to found the company and cons pursue consulting full time for three years was that I didn't see myself in a newsroom anymore. I didn't see a place where I was inspired by the leadership, where I felt they were putting their values first and really truly saying, we're building an environment where journalists of color can flourish. I was very, very, very done with being marginalized by my bosses, by being disrespected all the time, by being talked down to you and passed over. I just, the experience was not great. And again, big newsrooms, small newsrooms, legacy newsrooms, startups. It wasn't the format. It wasn't, you know, the medium. It was the culture of journalism. It really burnt me out. Uh, and so I enjoyed the flexible schedule of setting my own work. I enjoyed getting to choose my clients. 
basically I have three rules for my business, right? And this is not very sophisticated or exciting, but I don't work with assholes. I only do things that I want to do, and I don't do anything that I don't want to do. Which, it took me about a year to figure out that those are separate, right? Um, I do this because I want to do it, and I don't do this unless I'm going to pay a lot of money for it, right? So what's on your list that like you'll do push comes to shove, but like it's gotta it's gotta bring in a lot of money for you to do that kind of thing. So that was very important to me was figuring out the spectrum of things that I could do um, as a consultant as opposed to having like one type of job in a newsroom. So we do a mix of DEI training, uh, executive consulting, coaching for journalists. Um, I write a leadership accelerator for journalists of color working in local news. So I've run two classes of that now, um, where I bring together a cohort of journalists who all work in local, and we have like a six month uh, leadership building accelerator, and they all kind of get to work with each other and get coached by me, coached by other people in the industry, and hopefully stay in their newsrooms um, and, and flourish and do great things. So, um, you know, the company really just came out of me having a lot of interests and and figuring out that I could make money in a lot of different ways that I didn't really recognize at first. What do you see um, as what's coming next for our industry? Um, we're all as family trying to figure out a profitable business model to sustain the work that we do in Elevated. Um, what do you uh, see that's next or cutting edge that we can kind of take advantage of and utilize to kind of push that forward? You know, I'm thinking about metaverse, uh, chat, GBT, something like that. How do we incorporate, and instead of compete against this technology, how do we allow this to complement the work that we're ultimately trying to do? Yeah, I think, you know, ethical generative AI is, like, again, a very big topic to talk about. Um, but my advice to people as they think, forward looking is to always be curious the same way you would be curious about any other story, right? Report it out. Um, if you think there's something wrong, ask the questions, right? Um, evaluating emerging tech is very difficult, right? So band together, right? Use folks in this cohort, right? Ask around in this room. How are other newsrooms using chat GPT? How are other newsrooms thinking about um, you know, Mad Libs AI and things like that, right? Like, how are people in this room solving that problem, and how does that inform how you want to solve that problem? So I think, you know, the cohort that you have here is so valuable in terms of how you benchmark for going forward into your careers and into your futures, is you always have this peer network now to say, hey, y'all, is this normal? Is this weird of experiencing and observing the same thing that you are? Um, I think product thinking, though, writ large, is going to be very important for news leaders going forward. The ability to understand audience-driven products, right? So I've worked for a lot of editors-in-chief who say, I'm the editor-in-chief. It's a story because I say it's a story. I know our audience better than anybody, right? That's not going to fly in the future. I need audience research. I need data. I need personas. I need to know what is our end goal for these users, right? And I think the more that leaders have this audience first mentality, the idea of building something that creates a value for the reader, or viewer, the listener, or whomever. All right. Well, Emma, this has been a terrific opportunity to talk about creativity, flexibility, um, persistence. You personify all of those things with your work. I'll ask you one last question. Tell us a little bit about the Sincerely Leaders of Color newsletter. Yeah. So Sincerely Leaders of Color is a, or we're monthly now, but we were by weekly for the last two years. Uh, it's a column, but it's more than a column. Uh, we're kind of a community space, and we do talks. So it's myself, my partner, Kim Bowie, who works for the Arizona Republic. Um, and we founded this space for anyone who wants to make journalism better for journals of color. Um, so we pass the mic. We write our own columns. Um, last year, we asked white leaders to give us their commitments, not their predictions. 
what is actually what they were going to do in the coming year to make journalism more inclusive and better for journalists of color and folks from other marginalized backgrounds. So we're funded uh, through a couple of folks, CUNY, API, Open News, and um, we just want to make the industry awesome and less less powerless for journalists of color, especially leaders of color. So that means we tackle topics like pay transparency and how to be a leader in the bad times and how to keep DEI at the forefront of your strategy even as your budgets get cut. So, um, so we welcome uh, guest writers, we welcome suggestions, we welcome feedback, and, and we'd love to hear from you. You're really modeling for us how to be a positive, energetic leader in this business. So it is possible. So thank you so much for joining us. Let's show Emma our. And we will, we will stay in touch with you, and hopefully you can work with us in the future. Absolutely.